Hey y'all, this is Troy. So, oh my gosh, I'm just glad to even be on here today, to be honest. <laughs> I have had so many things uh, just happening this week, and I feel like, <clears throat> honestly, every day has felt like basically just a constant spiritual attack, which, you know, obviously some days feels that way. Um, it's not fun, but at the same time, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's not our strength. It's not our effort. And I know that. And what what's so amazing is the word says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So there's a lot of struggle that can happen in the middle of that. You know, as long as we have our faith in Jesus and what he's done and we are willing to share what God has done for us and we're willing to share what the blood of Jesus has done for us, you know, there's... <laughs> There's a lot of rough uh, room for rough patches in the middle there. And yet we still come out ahead. We still come out as overcomers, which is just very, very, very amazing to me. You know, just how deep the grace of God really runs uh, and how great his mercies really are and how amazing his strength really is. Even when I feel weak, you know, even when we uh, are facing hard times, you know, we're facing challenging things. So I'm not going to get into all of that because uh, man, I've got so much to share today that I just don't have time to get into the specifics behind stuff, but maybe next week. Uh, <laughs> oh, that reminds me. Actually, I am not going to be live streaming next Wednesday. I will be posting a video at the same time, Wednesday at 2 Central Time, but I'm not going to be live streaming next week. So just uh, FYI. One other thing before I get started, um, I just released the audiobook version of Stop Worrying. Uh, a lot of people have been asking for it. Um, it's me reading the book. So that is kind of cool. It took a long time to record it. I got it professionally done. And uh, it's not on Audible yet, but it's processing on Audible. So technically, it's been up for a few days on a few other sites. It's on Barnes & Noble. There's a link in the description on YouTube on this video. If you want to find that link to Nook you know, on Barnes & Noble, There's also it's also on booksamillion.com. It's on some other uh, audiobook websites. It's not on Audible yet, but it is coming and should be there hopefully maybe by the end of this week, at least by next week, hopefully. Um, but it is coming, so look for it. So there you go. If you haven't got it, it's in ebook as well. It's on Kindle and it's also in print form. You can get it in print as well. So here we go. I'm going to jump right in. If you are watching this at any point and you're wondering, are these prophecies true? Is there any, you know, uh, a record of accuracy here? You can go watch a video I recently posted where I share prophetic results, what happened after the fact, after after the prophecies were publicly shared. You can go see all the articles and all the links and everything and kind of get that question answered, hopefully. Um, there's a link to that video, again, uh, in the description of this video on YouTube if you haven't seen that video yet. And I'm going to be sharing more of those as I'm able to, um, just because people honestly ask that question. I know the critics are always going to be you know, asking those questions uh, in a, in a mean spirited way, but people also are honestly asking that question. Is, is there any record of these prophecies being true? And, you know, is, are these prophecies something we can trust? Yeah. At the same time, even with, with sharing the results and seeing the accuracy myself, you know, of the things the Lord has said, I still will honestly say, don't just believe everything a prophet or someone with a prophetic gift says, because they say it, but also test the spirits at the same time, you know, and judge the word. That's what the word says. We should be judging the words that are being shared. Number one, by what does the scripture say? And number two, by what is the Holy Spirit saying to me? Is he confirming this? And as soon as you get that confirmation from the Holy Spirit, you're good to go. You know, so if you're not in a place where you're receiving that, my prayer is that as you watch this today, you're going to get that, uh, that nearness to the Lord. You're going you're gonna to start to hear his voice in a clear and real way. And listen to me, he's already speaking to you, whether you're hearing him right now or not. He's already speaking. He's already drawing you unto him if you don't know him. But he is also speaking clearly to you if you're his child, if you know Jesus is your savior. You know, Jesus said that, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. We're the sheep. He's the good shepherd. And we can hear him. But a lot of times hearing God takes waiting upon him in faith. It just takes believing that what, what God has said about himself is true. He said, when we seek him, we will find him. He said, he's our very present help in time of need, in time of trouble. Those things are absolutely true. But if we don't believe them and stand on that word, we're, we're going to miss out on the help that he has for us and that nearness that he has for us. 
So uh, I'm going to be talking today about several different things. Uh, one of the words I've got has to do with one world leadership and government. And then, uh, and then I've got several different words from the Lord about mass delusions um, that are going to be happening, occurring. And I shared one of these, I believe, last week on the stream, a, a different one. It's so interesting that I'm getting a lot of words about this. And obviously, we're going to see a lot of this ramping up. It already is. You know, it's already there, obviously. But we're going to see it. And there's specific places we're going to be seeing it as well. So and I'm going to be sharing that. Um, one of the things the Lord asked me to talk about today was the lies versus truth, this idea of lies versus truth and how to recognize deception when it comes. So I'm going to be spreading. Uh, he gave me some specific passages to quote. I'm going to be spreading these out in between the, the prophetic messages I've gotten recently. I woke up this morning and as I woke up, I heard the words vain imagination, vain imagination. I looked up Romans 1 18. It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, suppress the truth. That that phrase jumped out at me. We can suppress the truth, obviously, by speaking against the truth online, right? Or, or anywhere in life. You know, people try to suppress the truth. But we can also suppress the truth in our, in our own hearts as believers and as unbelievers. And I'm going to show you this in a second that even unbelievers are suppressing the truth in their own hearts. Verse 19 says, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So this verse very clearly says that every single person who's ever existed has known that God is real, that God is there. It's, it's saying, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. That means God has placed inside of every person, every living person, a knowledge of himself, and a desire for him, you know, a, a yearning for God, a yearning for uh, the afterlife, a, yearn, a yearning for eternity, to know God. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made so that they are without excuse is what it says. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. So this is saying, it's talking about people that didn't technically know God in the sense of they having a personal relationship with him, but it's saying they knew him, meaning that they knew he was there, right? They did not honor him or, or give thanks, but they became futile in their reasonings. Okay, listen to this. They became futile in the reasonings. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. And this is what several of these words have to do with is this idea of, you know, coming at life from the perspective of, human reasoning versus spiritual reasoning or the reasonings of men and women instead of the reasonings of God, right? And the wisdom of people instead of the wisdom of God. And here's the, I'm just going to give away the ending. <laughs> the twist is this is not a message against unbelievers, you know, because unbelievers absolutely do this, but this is a, a warning and an encouragement and an exhortation for believers as well. Why? Because we fall into this trap as well sometimes in little ways. It says, and their senseless hearts were darkened. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of their, the incorrupt, incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible mankind. Okay. There's a war happening between unbelief and belief. And we're seeing the signs of it in culture and society today. Uh, and, and every single word I'm about to share has to do with this. I looked up uh, the definition of the word delusion because this is, this is the word that keeps coming up. And, and it's an idiosyncratic belief or impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is generally accepted as reality or rational argument. So the word delusion here has a, has a definition that is slightly different than I believe the definition God is using, because he's taking it a step further. And he's saying, this is not just something, you know, unbelief is not just something that goes against uh, the what's generally accepted, right? Because actually it's the other way around when we look in our world, right? You know, unbelievers would call Christians delusional, <laughs> you know? And there's probably more of that uh, mindset in, in culture and especially in the media than the other way around, you know? But here's what I believe God is saying is that because he's placed the knowledge of himself inside of every person, if we're not willing to acknowledge that truth and we're not willing to listen to him and hit to his wisdom, we are walking in a delusion. Why? Because the truth is there in front of us, is right in front of our eyes. And the more 
that people look around and they they see that that uh, the, this idea that God is not there, the more they see that that's generally accepted, the harder it becomes for them to accept the truth. Why? Because they're sinking more and more and more into that delusional mindset. You know, and I, and and if you're listening to me right now and you're you are not saved or you just don't know Jesus and this is offending you, please uh, don't take it in a mean spirited way because that's not my heart. I'm using harsh language, y'all, but I can say the same thing about myself. Like I've I've been there. I've been in that exact same place where I was questioning God's existence, you know, and the only thing that got me out of it was a real and loving God reaching down into my life and making himself known to me in a real way, you know, but it took me and, and I didn't earn it. I absolutely am not better than anyone else. I did not earn that, it, but it did take me responding to him in whatever little way I, I knew how to, whatever little faith I had, it was like tiny at the moment, you know, but I started to respond and listen to me, no matter who you are, God is drawing you to him and he's asking you to respond, even if it's with the most, the smallest amount of faith <laughs> in the world. Uh, this is what uh, that same passage I read, Romans 1, verse 16, I'm going back, ste stepping back a second, uh, a few verses says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So this is the war between unbelief and, and belief, right? It, it is, the question is, what do we do with the message of the gospel? When we hear that, that God became man as Jesus Christ, that he came down to earth, that he was fully God, fully man, that he lived a perfect life. When we hear that story, it's a truth, but it's also a, you know, a story in scripture. It's something that we read. It was, it, it's uh, the history of Jesus's life, right? When we hear that being told, what do we do with that? You know, that the, the fact that he went to the cross and he bore the punishment for our sins upon himself, you know, and, and I'm not just speaking to unbelievers here. As Christians, when we hear that truth, what do we do with it? Listen, listen to me. I'm going to be really uh, just honest with you right now. The last few weeks, I've been struggling with bitterness against God. And this is just me being honest. And the Lord has had to show me that the reason I'm struggling with it is because I've let my pride get built up. And I've, I've thought to myself, God, I've earned the right to receive something better than this from you, right? Like I've earned to be the, the right to be treated by you better than, than I am right now. Listen to me. When I've been hearing the gospel recently, let me tell you how I've been responding. And this is not every moment of every day, but it's been a struggle, you know. And the Lord, thankfully, has brought me out of this in the last couple of days. But the this is how I've responded is I've, I've thought, yeah, I know that. You know, like that's been my thought. Like, yes, I know the gospel. I got it. Don't worry. You know, like I don't even think about that right now, you know. But the here's the problem is that response and that mindset when it comes to the gospel and the word of God is that's, an, that's a response that's actually rooted in unbelief. And it's the wisdom of the world, not the wisdom of God. And it makes room for the devil to bring delusion into our life. This is what I heard about uh, West Texas on May 31st. So I'm just going to jump right into this first word, uh, and then I'm going to share some more later about that. But I, I heard the Lord say this on May 31st uh, when I was praying and, and waiting upon the Lord. He said, West Texas is in dire straits. And then I heard a storm is brewing, both good and bad. Good because of the rain, but bad because of the potential for destruction. And when I heard this, I got this impression that this was probably metaphorical. So sometimes I get the impression that it's re that this is a real thing that we're going to see. We may see a sign of this, you know, in nature or something like that. But I got the impression that this is a metaphorical thing, language that he's using here. Uh, and then I saw this vision of a plant in the desert, growing in the desert, that looked like it had these huge lips, like a person's mouth with huge lips, you know, with lipstick on. And then I heard the Lord say, there will be a delusion that someone tries to sell into law. And he said, vote it down. It's not good for you. This will appear to be a solution to the problem, but they won't be giving you the full picture of what they have planned. And then I heard the Lord say, if you live in the area of West Texas, and I know, you know, a lot of people listening do not. So I'm uh, just said, pray for wisdom and pray against this. Just be praying against this. And I live in Texas, so I'm going to be praying against this.
Hey, y'all. Sorry, I think it froze. Yeah, I think I, my internet dropped for some reason. But I'm back. <laughs> yeah, that is the first time that has happened to me on here on the live stream. So that's interesting. But that's what this week has been like. It's been one thing after the next that I feel like have, have, has been from the enemy trying to honestly just shut down the things that God is doing. So I'm just going to keep sharing, y'all, because <laughs> uh, I just know that the Lord is on this and I know the Lord is going to use this. Um, yeah, here we go. This is what I heard. Uh, this is what I saw. This is the only word I'm sharing today that's kind of unrelated to everything else, but I felt like uh, the need to get this out more quickly than typically. Uh, I, I heard, um, I saw this and heard this on June 9th. Okay. I, I laid down uh, to bed and I started to see these vivid visions of fires and forest fires. And then I saw a volcano and the lava like overflowing out of this volcano. And I got this impression that this is related to uh, Tuscany, like a region in Italy, and Tux Tuxen, if I'm saying that right, Arizona, like two uh, two names that sound similar to each other. And I heard the Lord say, "Both will see flames." And I, and I believe. And then I got this uh, very specific impression from the Lord that this is going to be around or near those areas, but not necessarily exactly there. But he's he's talking about both these areas because the names sound similar. Um, so, anyways, that's uh, okay. Yeah, the, I as I was I was prepping for this today, you know, and I started uh, and I looked up to make sure I was spelling Tux in Arizona right. I didn't look up to see if I was saying it right or not. And I saw that today they've been posting about um, huge fires in Flagstaff, Arizona. Now I know that that is several hours away from Tuxen, so I don't think this is necessarily related. Um, but I did not think that was coincidental, but that that was that was happening today and that I saw it happening today. Um, this is the next word I got. Uh, this, I got this on May 5th. Mm. And this uh, is a, about, well, I'll just tell you what I heard. OK, I heard the Holy Spirit say crab shells, crab shells. And then he heard, said an island off the coast of Madagascar. And then he said that he was going to talk to me about this when I looked it up. And so I looked this up. And what I found was there's an island called Seychelles, but it's often mispronounced seashells because of the way it's spelled. People say seashells, uh, you know, accidentally, but it's actually pronounced Seychelles. And what the Lord said was crab shells. And he said an island off the coast of Madagascar. So I looked at I, I looked at the Wikipedia page for that for this island. Uh, and I saw that they actually have. Uh, they have a bunch of crabs there, a different different types of crabs, and they also have one crab that's endemic to that to the island. So I thought that was pretty cool, uh, pretty good connection there. But anyways, I'm going to read this real fast, and then I'm going to read uh, what he said about it. Uh, I, this is the the Republic of Seychelles. This was on Wikipedia. It is an arch, archipelagic island. I don't know how to say that word. Country. It's a country consisting of 115 islands in the Indian Ocean at the eastern edge of the Somali Sea. So it's 115 different islands. That's interesting. It's off the east coast of Africa, sort of between Madagascar and the Maldi Maldives. Maldives. I know how to pronounce that. I've just forgotten now. Oh my gosh. All right. <laughs> this is what I heard the Holy Spirit say. He said, something is coming for this nation, uh, a time of shaking for my people. And then he said, people will say this is unnatural, not normal. It will cause a holy awakening to develop, a holy awakening to develop. And then I heard him say, showers of mercy. People will cry out for me and my salvation. And then he said, a delusion is involved, a stamping out of rights during the time of shaking. Ooh. And then I got this impression that, uh, that this word was for July. Now, I don't know if that means it's going to happen in July or if it's going to happen around July. Uh, or if I was supposed to share this in July instead of June, but I did pray about this and the Lord said, go ahead and share it today because it had to do with delusions. So, uh, so I went ahead and shared it today. Uh, but here's what I know about the Lord. You know, the Lord's talking about delusions here and it's something that we see, uh, not just outside of the church, but in the church sometimes. Okay. But what I know is that God is not a God of, uh, confusion. He's not first Corinthians 14, 33 says for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. He's a God of peace. He's a God of order. God knows everything. God knows everything. And the question that I'm hearing in my spirit right now is, if God knows everything, why does he speak 
in ways that we don't understand sometimes, you know, like, especially with words like this, you know, some of these things that I'm sharing on here, maybe some of the other prophetic words you've heard sometimes before in other places, you, you've heard it and you thought, if this were from God, wouldn't it be more specific? You know, and I've seen that question on my channel too. If this was from God, you would be saying it a whole lot more specifically. Uh, but I want to remind you of something that happens in scripture. And it's the fact that Jesus um, oftentimes would share things in uh, like parabolic language. I'm looking up this verse right now. Um, it's Matthew 13, 34. It says, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak anything to them without a parable. He did not speak anything to them without a parable. So one argument for, you know, prophetic words that sound very parabolic is, well, it's following the standard that Jesus set, you know, so you can't get mad about that. <laughs> but here's the other reason for it is that, you know, the word talks about how, um, and Jesus, I believe, even references, the Gospels reference this Old Testament passage that talks about how even the, though the people were seeing, they, they didn't really see. And even, even though they were hearing, they couldn't really understand, right, what they were hearing. And, and so it was like this idea of God giving them just enough to see if they would respond in faith and seek out the truth, just enough of that knowledge, you know, that same knowledge that's inside of our hearts that God is there and that he loves us and that he has a good plan for us. You know, the same knowledge that God can be trusted, that he is a good God, you know, but at the same time, the devil's coming along and he's trying to snatch away that little bit of faith that God gives us. You know, and sometimes through that parabolic language, God, God hands us an opportunity and he says, listen to me you know there's something about this word that's that's different than just a person speaking and blabbering you know you know there's something different about it because the holy spirit's on it and then he's giving us an opportunity there to not just respond to what we hear but to respond to the stirring of the holy spirit in our hearts you know it's that that faith response but then the devil comes along and he uses that vain imagination the thoughts that rise up against the knowledge of god and he says no if that was god it would sound a whole lot more specific. He says things like that. You know, that's an argument from Satan and he's appealing to our intellect, but God is appealing to our hearts. <laughs> he's appealing to that part of us that knows that he's there, you know, and, and, and he's waiting for us to step out in faith. So when we hear a prophetic message and it sounds too good to be true, yes, we need to test the spirits, you know, or if it's a prophetic word, but it hasn't happened yet, especially a specific one when someone speaks something over your life, and you're saying, God, why is this taking so long? Is did it did I just hear wrong? Or did they hear wrong? Or are you just did you not just you didn't follow through with what you're gonna do? Is that what it is? You know, when we start to have those thoughts, we need to come back. We need to get that word confirmed from the Holy Spirit again. And then we need to be reminded and remind ourselves of who it is that spoke the word. You know, who spoke that word? If it was God, you can trust it. But listen, you also need to remind yourself, yourself of who is speaking the word against that word. Who's the one bringing those uh, those thoughts of unbelief? You know, if it's the devil and, and we can recognize that, then suddenly it makes it so much more clear who we should be listening to. You know, if you had a, two buttons in front of you uh, today and it was like, listen to God today or listen to Satan, which button would you push? Right. It's not always that clear. It's not always that clear. But it, it becomes more and more clear the more that we respond to God with belief, the more and more that we decide in our heart that I am going to be a person of belief. I'm going to be a man or a woman of faith. I'm going to stand in faith, even in the hard times, even in the, the hard seasons like this week has been for me and and my wife. You know, we've just we've been having a, a somewhat of a hard a hard week. But uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I've had to make that decision this week, y'all. I've had to make that decision. I am going to listen to God today and I'm going to stand on the, the knowledge that he is good despite my circumstances. This is what 1 Corinthians, uh, that same passage that says, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Verse 29, a couple of verses before verse 33, it says, have two or three prophets speak and have the others pass judgment. So I've been talking about that. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, then the first is to keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted and the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. So there's a couple things here that I want to pull out real quick. And one is that God wants to speak to you and you can hear from God yourself if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. The second thing is the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. One of the things, and I'm just going to go ahead and say this <laughs> since I'm being very raw today. One of the things the Lord spoke to me recently he, is he actually rebuked me a little bit. Uh, and corrected me. 
on something. And I don't have the word uh, here hadn't pulled up, but uh, essentially what he said was, he said, sometimes you're sharing things um, too quickly before you get the full interpretation from me on it. And, and it's confusing. And so I just want to apologize right now if uh, if you've seen a word and I've, I've apologized on a video last week for the same thing, but I want to say it again in case you missed that. If you've gotten a word uh, from me on this channel and it was confusing, I am I am very sorry. Um, now, that that is that's my side of it. Right. But there's also the idea that God does speak through parables and parabolic language. I'm about to film a video later today after this stream that's very parabolic. And that's all God has given me, you know, and he's given me the yes to go ahead and film it. You know, so sometimes, you know, it's we're confused because we haven't waited upon the Lord. Right. <laughs> and to get the clarification on and the clarity of what he's saying. Other times we're confused because God has spoken something that he's 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 reaching his hand out to us and inviting us deeper. He's drawing us deeper, you know, and a lot of times it's not a word that we hear that's confusing us. It's the situation. We're saying, God, if I obeyed you and I did what you told me to do, why is my why is a situation like this happening to me? Why am I walking through this when I shouldn't be? And here's what God is saying is I allow that situation to come in so that I could see how you respond to it, just like the book of Job. Right. You know, I think a lot of people are confused by the ending of Job where God God corrects Job on something. But he also says, but you uh, uh, you have you've been righteous throughout this, you know, like it's and it's like, how is he righteous throughout it if he had to be corrected on something? Right. Here's what I believe happens in Job. I believe Job. Kept responding to God in a righteous way. But I believe he allowed some of that anger into his heart over what was happening. You know, he's looking around and saying, God, I'm doing everything right. So haven't I, in a sense, earned <laughs> a better life than what you're giving me right now? You know, he was, he was walking down that path toward bitterness, right? I believe he would have gotten there. I don't know if he did or not, but I believe he would have gotten there if he had continued on. You know, but it was it was this idea that he knew he was doing what God had asked him to do. He knew he was doing the right thing. But then it was like he had an opportunity in that moment to write to rise up to a new level of faith. And I think he missed that a little bit. He missed out on a little bit on that opportunity. I mean, I think he I think he 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 hit the ball out of the park in some ways, right? Because a lot of us would not have been as faithful as Job. But the but one of the things he missed, I believe, was this idea that. You know, even when all these things are happening bad to me, I'm going to stand on the truth that God is good, that knowledge that he's given me, that he's good, that he's faithful, and that he's true, and that he can still be trusted, and he's still worthy of praise. You know, I think the test sometimes in a hard season as to whether we're, uh, whether we've allowed anger or bitterness into our hearts against God is, are we still praising him or not? You know, are we still singing to him? Are we still saying, thank you, Jesus? Are we, are we still uh, looking at the cross? Are we still meditating on the gospel and letting it change our heart? There's no better time to meditate on the gospel than when everything around you is going wrong. Why? Because that is the moment. That's the opportunity moment for you to raise to a new level of faith and for, for the gospel to sink in in a new way and, and for it to become deeper and more real to you than it ever has before. Mm -hmm. So... I'm gonna I'm gonna share the, I'm gonna share a few more passages real fast, and then I'm gonna jump into uh, this, what I heard on June 5th from the Lord. Um, this fight for truth versus lies is is not just in the natural. Obviously, we see it in the natural, but it's a spiritual in nature. Um, I'm uh, I'm just gonna share. I'm gonna give you this passage if you want to go look it up. It's Jeremiah chapter 20, uh, verses 9 through 11. And it's, it's just Jeremiah talking about this struggle that he has with doing the right thing, but everybody else coming against him because he's speaking the truth. Um, if you want to go, if you want to go read that, you can. Um, but I'm going to actually read Revelation 9, starting in verse eight, 18. Okay. It says, A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke, the brimstone, which came out of their mouths. For the power of the, ho of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. Here we go. Parabolic language. If you want to see some parables, go read Revelations. Um, 
Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. So here's here's the uh, what the Lord was showing me in this passage this week was that these people were so far into this delusional mindset, this, this demonic way of thinking, that even when the wrath of God literally is being poured out, they would not repent. And, and it's because they are steeped in this basically demon worship, right? Which to me sounds crazy. You know, it's like, why at that point, why would you keep going the same direction? Why would you keep doing it? You know, and it all comes back to there were, there were little steps that someone kept taking away from the truth, away from the knowledge of God in their heart. And listen to me, I know this is a huge, you know, vivid, uh, (laughs) extreme example of this concept, but we do the exact same thing. We do the exact same thing. Every day we're taking little steps toward the truth or away from it, toward belief in what God has said or away from it. Scripture also shows us that just because someone has a religion doesn't necessarily mean they have the truth. Just because we're in church does not mean we lived a faith, faith-filled faith life that week. You know, Just because we're reading our Bible does not mean we're walking in belief in that moment. It's a choice of the heart. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. I want you to see this if you've never seen this before. The Old Testament uh, Jewish nation, the Israelites, were the children of God. They had the law of God. But listen to me, they did not yet have the truth. And you, you know, that might sound crazy to you, but it says, "Great the, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Jesus had not yet come. Now they had uh, some truth, right? And they had truths from God in the law, you know, and the principles of God and the things God had told them. Right, and they had foreshadow a foreshadowing of Jesus coming through the prophets, but it says grace and truth were realized, fully realized through Jesus Christ. John eight thirty two says, "And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free." So this is what happens when we know Jesus personally, and when we don't just meet Him one time, but it's like our whole life revolves around Him, and just getting to know Him more personally more intimately, just saying every day, Jesus, I want to know you, even if it hurts today. (laughs) That's oftentimes the test of faith is I want to know you, even if I have to lose these other things that I want today. But when we're in that season, in that place of just resting and abiding in Christ, we're going to get more and more free. So here's a test. Are we listening to the lies or are we listening to the truth of God? Are we getting free? Are we consistently getting more free? And if we're not, if we're bound in sin or or even things like shame, you know, or condemnation or guilt or uh, self-pity, you know, these are things that bind us and they all have a root. And the, that root is the lies of Satan, you know, and the way out of these things is the truth. Listen to me. Things like depression when, when there's a spiritual root cause, things like depression and anger and unforgiveness and fear and self-pity and anxiety, these things can be fixed when we fix the root cause, which is a lie from Satan. When we, when we undo the lie and we start to believe the truth. Listen, I used to struggle with depression. Like, this is my story. I used to struggle with depression and anxiety and fear, so much so that I could not sleep at night. I would get three hours of sleep every night on average, and then I would have to crash, you know, after like five or six nights, and I would sleep for like 15 hours and not get up that day. But I And I was trying to sleep. You know, I was laying in bed, lights off, trying to fall asleep. And I could not sleep because I was so depressed and so angry and so anxious. And the day that Jesus stepped in, the day that I met Jesus, and I saw the truth, and here's the truth that changed it. The truth was, I can know a God who loves me despite everything I've ever done. And he fully accepts me based on what Jesus did. 
And if I just believe in what Jesus did, I can be free. <laughs> Someone needs to hear this today. The gospel 100% works every time. 100%. First John 4, 6 says, we are from God. The one who knows God listens to us. The one who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Here's something that the scripture is giving us right here. It's saying, do you want to know if somebody is being uh, pulled around, yanked around with a chain by Satan through his lies over time, you know, seeping into someone's subconscious? Do you want to know if this person is being led by the Holy Spirit or if, or if Satan's got a hold on them? Okay. We can recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of error, and we can see it in our own hearts. It's the same thing I said earlier. It is that it says the one who knows God listens to us. What were, what were they saying? They were preaching the gospel, right? Everything, everything <laughs> had to do with what Jesus had done, and it still should in the church. Everything should have to do with what Jesus did for us. Anytime you start talking about the gospel, anytime you start talking about what Jesus did, what is somebody's reaction to it, or what's the reaction in my heart? If the reaction is to kick, like, uh, like okay, I got that. I got it. I got it. You know, I've heard people say that to me where I'm like, I'm like, I start telling my story and I start telling about what Jesus did. And I'm like, the day that I understood what Jesus did, you know, that what he suffered for me and I start to describe it. And then they immediately try to shut me down. They're like, yeah, I know that. I know I got all that. You know, I immediately can, can see that there's a spirit, spirit of error at work in their mind that the devil has, has, has been able to intervene, you know, and, and has, has been lying to them because, because, you know, there's the, those things are always going to butt heads, always be in contrast with each other. This is what verse two says. Okay. That was verse six, first John four, six, first John four, verse two through three. But by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. This is exactly what I've been saying. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the antichrist, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. You know, we see this all the time when a politician says something like, yes, uh, we should pray, you know, or let's take a moment of silence, you know, or, you know, even as general as that, or something like something like in God, we trust, you know, these are religious things that make us feel better about that person. But that does not mean that they are being led around by the spirit of truth. Why? Because you can have religion without truth. And the Bible very clearly says by this, you know, the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So if they never get around to talking about Jesus, something is very wrong. <laughs> Same with pastors. OK, this is how we can recognize false teachers and false prophets. You know, and the word warns us about this. It, Jesus said there's going to in the last days, there's going to be many false prophets arising, you know, and the New Testament warns us there are going to be many false teachers. Right. How do we know that they're false? Here's one very clear indicator if they never get around to talking about what Jesus did on the cross. It's, it's that simple. Why? Because the devil will, the, the devil's okay with talking about religion and Christianity and Christian things all day long, as long as you never talk about Jesus. That's what the devil, that's, that's the devil's stance on that. <laughs> okay. So how do we hear the truth, okay? How do we hear the truth from God? Number one is we have to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We have to do uh, what I've been talking about. We have to believe. It's that difference between unbelief and belief. We have to reject the unbelief and say, Satan, I don't want to listen to you anymore. I want to listen to my creator who loves me. His name is Jesus, and he died for me, and I'm giving my life to him. And whatever he says, that's what I'm going to do. And when we do that, we start a real relationship with Jesus and there are a few people I believe on the stream that need to do that right now. So I'm going to take a minute and I'm going to do that. I want you to pray with me right now. If you say, I am, I'm done running. I need Jesus. I need the truth. I need to hear him clearly. And then I'm going to tell you the second way that you can, that you can uh, hear the truth. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, while I'm praying. Okay. Just pray with me right now. Do not wait. Say, Jesus, I need to hear you today. I'm, I'm done running. I'm going to start running to you instead of running away from you. I need you to save me right now. This is a, a decision that's happening in your heart right now. You need to make that decision, not just pray your prayer. Say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you right now. I give you my everything. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for messing up so badly. But I thank you that when you died for me, you covered all of that. 
and I get to be free today. And I get to be made whole and new today in you, Jesus. I want you to continue praying. This is John 16, 13. It says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose it to you what is to come. So here's the second way we hear the truth is that we have a personal relationship with Jesus and Jesus fills us with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit explains the truth to us. He helps us understand the word of God and he helps us know how to live this life in a way that pleases God. And here's what's so amazing about the Holy Spirit. He reminds us during in those times where where we're, we are, in a sense, rejecting the gospel to an extent. We're just not wanting to hear it. We're bitter at God. We're, we're questioning God's goodness. In those times, the Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus did for us. He's the one. If you've ever wondered why that happens, it's the Holy Spirit that says, come here, come here, my friend. Come here and look. Come look at what Jesus did again. Let it soften your heart again. Let it change your heart. So I want you to pray with me right now and say, Holy Spirit, come into my life. Set me free from the lies of the enemy. I want to know the truth. I want to know you. I want to know what the word has to say about my life. I want to know how to apply it. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask for baptisms in the Holy Spirit right now. (laughs) Across many people listening right now, whether live or, or listening later, doesn't matter to God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. This is what God spoke to me on June 5th. Uh, He said, I'm bringing the joy of revival back to my church. And the operative word there was joy, okay? He said, joy comes when you know where you stand with God and you realize he isn't mad at you. When you realize how great it is, great a grace he has shown you and you fully accept it into every fiber of your being. Sometimes I believe we have uh, the fear of revival without the joy of revival. The Lord said, I'm bringing the joy of revival back to my church. You know, and what I mean by the fear of revival is we have this idea that if we don't start seeing revival, we're afraid we're doing something wrong. You know, uh, But listen, we may just be missing revival because we need his joy to come back. We need the joy of his presence again. And when we get that joy back, (laughs) revival just happens. It just overflows out of us. This is what 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 14 says. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. How do you do that? You do it through joy. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy set before him, right? Verse nine, for who saved us and called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace. It's not on your shoulders. It's not up to you. You don't have to be, you you don't have to do everything perfect for God to use you. Why? Because it's according to his purpose and grace. Now we do need to stay in that place of belief where we're responding to the Holy Spirit. You know, we need to abide in Christ to bear much fruit is what Jesus said. But it's his effort. It's his work. It's Jesus's work on the cross that does it. It says, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things. You can suffer through a lot of things when you got the joy of the Lord. Why? Because it's your strength. And then, and then, and then he says, Paul says, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. (laughs) He's he's suffering, but he's not ashamed. Why? Because he knows whom he has believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to protect what I have entrusted to him until that day. what What did Paul entrust to God? His heart. He 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 entrusted his life to him. He gave him his belief no matter what. And we see that other places in scripture, you know, uh, the, the three men of the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they entrusted their heart to God. They entrusted their belief to God and they let, they left everything else up to God. And Jesus, <laughs> when he said, 
Lord, take this cup away from me. But if it's not possible, he said, not my will be done, but your will be done. You know, Jesus was the perfect example of this. He entrusted his heart to God. He said, God, you know, and, and the word even talks about how Abraham believed that if Isaac was going to die, that God could raise his son Isaac, that God could raise him from the dead. You know who else had to believe that? According to scripture, Jesus, Jesus had to believe that when I go, God is going to bring me back. He was entrusting his heart to God, not just his actions, but his, his belief because Jesus did not go to the cross bitter. And I believe many of us do this. We're saying, God, I'm obeying you. I'm doing the right thing. But we're bitter about how God has let things wind up. And that's where I've been. You know, I'm being honest today. That's where I've been lately. But God is pulling me out of it. Thank the Lord. <laughs> but this is how we get out of that place, you know, is just looking, letting the Holy Spirit turn our eyes back to what Jesus did for us. Verse 13, hold on to the example of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Protect through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. What's that treasure? It is the joy of the gospel. <laughs> Protect the treasure in your heart. The treasure is the parable that Jesus told about the man who found this, this, this pearl of great price, you know, and he he traded everything for it. It's the it's it's the value of the gospel. It's 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 the value of knowing what God has done for you. Listen to me and knowing that he's not mad at you anymore. He's not mad at you because of what Jesus did for you. So you can let that shame fall off. The Holy Spirit, I believe, is, yeah, yeah, he's confirming this right now. He's pulling shame off of people. He's pulling fear off of people from past mistakes. Those generational curses are now a lie. Okay? They're not the truth anymore. Listen to me. They're not the truth. Why? Because the gospel has come in and has, has made room for you to be free. Because the Holy Spirit has come in and said, that's not you anymore. That's not your life anymore. That's not your family's heritage anymore. You get to be free. And now you don't have to walk in fear of that. You don't have to walk in shame anymore. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, this is what I heard uh, on May 9th. And I heard this specifically. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But the Lord did tell me that this was not going to make a lot of sense, <laughs> but he said it is going to, to make sense later. So I'm going to share it, be faithful, and then we're going to see what happens, okay? This is one of those things that I'm just like, it is, that's what it is. That's how prophecy goes sometimes. Uh, what I saw was a vision of slices of bread in rows and being shuffled together, okay? Like almost like cards, a deck of cards, but it was slices of bread. And then I saw a wooden boat in rough waters having a hard time. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, London fog. London is on the fritz. And I looked up fritz. It means a machine or device that's not working properly. And then I saw a vision of pumpkins and hay decorations that were surrounding this stone monument. And the monument was made out of stone, was shaped like the state of Louisiana. So here we go. <laughs> a little weird, right? But I heard the Lord say, he clarified this, and he said, both the state of Louisiana and London, like England, uh, are going to be involved in the same struggle this fall around the same time. And that's what the pumpkins and the hay decorations around this stone monument, obviously we're representing the fall time. And, I, and I'm not sure what the slices of bread uh, have to do with necessarily, but I believe it could be a food related thing because the, the next thing I heard was, excuse me. The next thing I heard was, Fog is confusion, censorship, a blanket of confusion. So he said, London fog, London is on the fritz. And then he explained, fog represents confusion or censorship, censorship, which are two different things, but I believe there's, these things are going to go together, this, this time of confusion, censorship, and a blanket of confusion. And then I saw a, a vision of snow on a birdhouse, and I heard the Lord say, it will be resolved by winter for one, not the other. So one of these two, London, Louisiana, we're going to see this happening in the fall. And then he said, it'll be resolved by winter for one, not the other. And then I immediately saw these, this vision of these food signs, like signs for like restaurants and places that sell food, right? One of them said, uh, Andouille, uh, 
which is spelled different than it sounds, but it's a it's basically like a Cajun sausage. So I, you know, when I saw that, I looked it up to make sure, but I think I, I had a guess that it was like a Cajun thing. Um, and then I saw a sign that said Justin's Place, and then I saw another sign that said LSU. It said LSU Marketplace, um, and LSU Marketplace could be like uh, a place where they sell. It's a website where they sell tickets for LSU games, or it could represent also a marketplace as in food like a food venue on the campus, you know, or like the food, the way that where they get their food from the distributor or something like that. I looked up Justin's place. It's not a place in Louisiana. It's somewhere else. But I honestly believe the impression I got was this is not a specific restaurant the Lord's talking about. Because what I found is Louisiana has a lot of restaurants like this that are like, you know, Jacob's place, Justin's place, this kind of this kind of idea, you know, with similar types of food. So I believe the Lord here is just literally just talking about, um, in general, uh, he's generalizing like restaurants in Louisiana and Cajun type of food. Uh, and obviously LSU is, uh, you know, Louisiana State University. So, <laughs> all right, that we're just going to have to, I'm going to move on since that one's probably a little confusing there. Lord, I, I just ask that you would help this to land the way it's supposed to land and that this would make sense when we see what happens in the fall and the winter. So this is what I heard last year. Uh, and this is the word I was going to share, I believe, last week, and the Lord told me to wait. And so this is what I heard. I saw a vision of a Swedish currency, um, like from Sweden. And I heard uh, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit say, Sweden is under attack, instability within, and danger without. And he said, I'm picking a new leader they are going to see it. People are going to use this as an opportunity to uh, an opportunity to push toward one world order or government. And so I looked this up, y'all. I heard this last year, okay? Uh, and I looked it up, and it's very interesting because um, they actually got a new prime minister uh, on, let me see, uh, let me make sure. Magdalena Anderson, uh, she's the leader of the Swedish Social Democratic Party. She was installed as the prime minister on the 30th of November, 2021, following the resignation of, I don't know how to pronounce his name, of the same party in June, okay? This is very interesting because the Lord told me, I heard this word last year, and the Lord told me to wait until June to share it, wait until next June, like 2022, this month, to share this word. And then I was, I looked at it and I was like, Lord, did I completely miss this? Because this lady, uh, uh, I mean, the other guy, the, the, the other prime minister, like he resigned in June, I believe of 2021, you know, so last, last June. And I was, and I kept praying about this and saying, Lord, did I like miss this by a whole year? Like what's going on here? You know, but I technically did not hear the word. So I was like, Lord, is this about what happened last year? You know, like, is that what it's about? But the Lord specifically told me to wait until this June to share it. So I honestly believe it's not. And I believe that's what the Holy Spirit is confirming, is that this this is not what happened. It's what's going to happen still. Uh, and that's what the Lord is talking about here. Okay. But there's some behind the scenes there, y'all. I I pray and I and I make sure that I know what I'm hearing from the Lord before I share it. Um, at least, at least I try to, you know, obviously I'm not perfect and I don't claim to be perfect, but who, here we go. This is what I heard on June 14th. Okay. This was yesterday. And this is why I believe the Lord told me to wait to share this and why he told me to wait last week when I was planning on sharing this last week. Okay. Obviously, you know, the, the word I heard was, um, I'm picking a new leader. They're going to see it. People are going to use this as an opportunity to push toward one world order or government. Okay. Then I heard on June 14th yesterday, Sweden is about to go through a time of shaking. The Lord likes to use that phrase, time of shaking, and I'm okay with it, okay? I used to get upset about that kind of stuff. I'm like, Lord, you're generalizing, right? And now I'm like, you know what? The word says prophesy in according, according with, to your faith, in accordance with your faith. So what I've realized is maybe it's not, the problem is not on God's end. I know it's not on his end. Maybe the problem's on my end, you know? Maybe it's like if I need, if I want to get more specific, then that, if, if I want the Lord to be more specific with me, maybe I need to have better faith, you know, more faith. So anyways, I thought that was funny. All right, here we go. Moving on. June 14th, Sweden is about to go through a time of shaking. A mass revival stems forth, but unlooked for and out of place when it comes to the world's agendas. They will fight back. 
It will be unlooked for even in the church in this area, and persecution will break out there too. My movement can't be stopped or blocked. It can only be shut down in the hearts of those who hear and refuse to believe what I'm saying, who refuse to believe my word, my grace. And he said, my son's choice changed everything to obey, to be killed, to refuse to quit. I, this is blowing my mind right now, y'all. This literally is blowing my mind. I, This is literally blowing my mind. I'm not kidding. How the Lord has like so seamlessly put this message together. And bef- 15 minutes before I got on here, I could not even remember because I'm just tired, like physically. Couldn't remember what I was going to talk about. <laughs> I'm like, what? This is, this is really cool. This is really cool to me right now, okay? When he said that, and this is what I had written down yesterday, okay? He said, uh, my movement can't be stopped or blocked. It can only be shut down in the hearts of those who hear and refuse to believe what I'm saying. This is what the Lord's been speaking this whole stream today, is that we have a choice in our hearts, even as believers. You know, and he's ta- I believe he's talking about a revival, not just in the church, but he's talking about people getting saved as well, right? But he's, he's saying we have this choice, and this is where we shut down the movement of the Holy Spirit. It's right here. It's, it's, it's in the belief in our heart. It's either we choose to believe his word, his grace, or we choose not to. And then he reminds us here, my son's choice changed everything. And this is the same thing the Lord was giving me earlier on the stream, to obey. Jesus obeyed no matter what. You know, he obeyed even to death. To be killed, like he was willing to go for through sacrifice, torture, and death for us, to refuse to quit. So good, y'all. It's so good. He had that joy set before him, and that's how he endured the cross. And that's what the Lord said earlier about revival is, is he's bringing that. We need that, re, that joy of revival. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to jump to that and then I'm going to finish this one. I'm bringing the joy of revival back to my church. That's so good. I'm bringing the joy of revival back. Okay. This is the next thing I heard. Um, a revival in the Lord's describing this revival. Now he says a revival strengthened by the sorrows of those who give everything for my name's sake, much consequence, but also much growth too. I want you, oh yeah, and then that was for me. Okay, I won't share that part. He said, much consequence, but also much growth too. Man, this is this is good. This is good. Oh my gosh. All right. I'm going to read a few more verses about this, uh, and then I'm going to read this conclusion uh, that the Lord gave me yesterday, okay, about this. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we do not presume to rank or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they have no understanding. So what Paul is talking about here is he's specifically talking about other preachers and teachers who were building each other up, but they were all kind of just off, you know, about certain things. Right. And, and they were, but he says they were measuring themselves by themselves. This is what happens when we are following a delusion is we start to measure ourselves by the other people that are also listening to the lie. But here's the answer to it. Back to verse three. I keep going forward and then I jump back to this is interesting with the verses. Okay. I was in 12, verse 12, 2 Corinthians 10, now verse three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, and the Lord is saying right now that this is prophetic, that all, a lot of these verses, I've been reading a later verse in the chapter and I'm moving back. And what the Holy Spirit is saying right now is he's point, painting a picture of if you're just teaching truth and you're just learning truth from God and, and, it, and you're building on a clean slate, you can just build from the ground up. But if you are, if there's lies and there's delusion, you first have to break down the lie and then you can go back and you can replace it with the truth. And I believe that's what the Lord is saying prophetically right now. Uh, for, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage battle according to the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. (laughs) Yeah. The answer again is not in the flesh. Yes. Yes. We can fight for truth in our world. We can fight for truth in our culture. We can fight for truth in the political arena. But the answer is in the spiritual realm. And we destroy the arguments and arrogance and everything that's raised against the knowledge of God. How? By first taking thought every captive in our minds and our hearts to the obedience of Christ. It's by allowing the Holy Spirit to 
sanctify us every day. It's by allowing him, you know, and that's that word sanctification, man, gets a bad rap. So the same as like repentance. You know, we just have this feeling of negativity toward it, I think sometimes, but there's so much good that comes with it. And, the, and it really all is good. Anything that's from the Lord is good. And I think that's what God is trying to, the place he's trying to get us to. Anything that's from him is good. Anything that's from him is good. Sanctification, repentance, you know, correction. <laughs> it's all good if it's from him. Why? It's because it's for our good, because he loves us. That's why he's doing it. One of the things we see in scripture is they, that the, the children of Israel, the Jewish nation, they had a problem with demons in scripture. Okay. Jesus had to cast so many demons out. If you just look at the look at the gospels, he just went around healing the sick, casting out demons most of the time, you know, and then he would teach. But he would also perform signs and wonders, healing the sick, casting out demons, and several times we see him raising the dead. But here's the thing. If they had problems with demons back then, when their whole culture and society was based around the idea of they were the children of God and they were all going to follow God, right? Th think about how much of a problem we have now <laughs> with the, the culture that revolves around things like money and sex and fame and, you know, and this life, like getting pleasure out of life, like, and, and entertainment, like the culture revol and, and, and careers, you know, the culture revolves around things that are very ungodly in some cases, you know, in some ways. And, I think part of the problem, even in the, especially in the church that we have is we start thinking like, well, we don't have as big of a problem with demons today as they did back then, you know, and that's why Jesus was casting demons out of people a lot. But the truth of the matter is we have just as much of a problem with it, just as much of a problem. And they're just as active and they're, they are just as conniving and they're just as evil and they're lying to people just as often. And even to Christians, okay, they they are trying to throw us off track as much as possible. So what do we do? What's the answer? We don't wage battle according to the flesh, but we destroy arguments and arrogance raised up against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We come back into the throne room by grace and through faith, and we say, Father God. I believe I can come into your presence right now by the grace of God, because of what Jesus did for me, his blood that was shed on my behalf, even with my mistakes, even with my failures, even with the lies I've been believing, I can, I can come in and, and you can set me free. <laughs> and we can say, God, I need your Holy Spirit. I need the spirit of truth. And I need you to shut the devil's mouth. And we can get free from the lies. And the Holy Spirit will start to... Teach us all truth. And he, you know, he'll start to lead us into all truth. And he'll start to say, hey, you've been bitter at God and you actually need to see what Jesus did so that you can get set free from that. You know, or he'll say, hey, you've been unforgiving against this person and, and you need, again, to see what Jesus did for you again so you can let that go and so you can love them instead. Or he'll say, hey, you've been uh, greedy. You've been selfish. You've been, you've been uh, trying to, to take things for yourself and you've not had a generous heart. And he'll say, you need to see again what Jesus did for you so that your heart can change in this area. Or he'll say, hey, you've been idolizing these things in your life or you've been exalting these things and instead of exalting Jesus. And he'll say, you need to look again at what Jesus did. Or he'll say, hey, you've been thinking too highly of yourself. And he'll say, you need to look over here again at what Jesus did. It's the only answer that's ever going to work. <laughs> James 3, 14 through 17 says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. You know, these are the things that the Holy Spirit is wanting to bring out of us. And, it, and, it's, it, he's, and it's, it's calling them a lie against the truth, right? It says, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic, okay? A lot of times the devil will try to mask himself behind just 
normal natural feelings, right? But you know what James says? He, he goes so far and he says, this is earthly natural wisdom and it's demonic. And he says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder. L look at that disorder. God is not a God of, of disorders. He's not a God of confusion. He's a God of order and a God of peace, right? He's not a God of delusion. He's a God of truth, right? It says, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above, God's wisdom, right, is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, and free of hypocrisy. That's what I want, y'all. That's what we as Christians should want. We, we should want wisdom that's so pure and peace-loving and gentle and reasonable and full of mercy and good fruits, impartial. That means we love everybody the same. That means we're not we're not acting in, in with this mindset of judgmentalism, but instead we are extending the same grace that we received to other people. Freely we receive, freely we give, and free of, of hypocrisy. It means we're not hiding things. We're not hiding things from God, and we're not hiding things from ourselves. This is the, the conclusion I heard from the Holy Spirit uh, yesterday. He said, these two things go hand in hand. And he's talking about one world leadership and delusion. Okay, this idea of delusion in the world, you know, if people go in a certain direction and then, and hey, baby, I'm still streaming. Can you wait till I'm done? Okay. You want to come say hi? <laughs> she doesn't want to say hi. Okay, she ran out. That's my four-year-old daughter, Laura Lee. Uh, she looks like she's about to go swimming. So I guess I need to get off so I can uh, go set the pull-up for me or whatever. The, they have like a little blow-up pull in the backyard. All right, sorry. These two things go hand in hand is what the Lord said. One world leadership and delusion. And then he said, the, uh, the more confused people are, the more they will look to someone to lead them and to fix the problem. And then he said, informational errors lead to chaos and chaos leads to surrender of rights until nothing is left. And then he told me to say this outright. He said, say this, they're looking for a savior, but there is only one and he already came. There's only one, Jesus, and he already came. And the amazing thing is what he did for us is still just as powerful today as it was 2,000 years ago. I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to end this. Lord Jesus, oh, I just ask that you help me and every person listening. Help us, Lord. We just come before you right now knowing that we're not good enough on our own, by our own efforts, but it's your blood, Jesus, that makes us righteous in, in the Father's eyes. Gives us access to your throne room. Gives us allows us to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. It allows us to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. And we just say, Lord, whatever's in our hearts today, that doesn't come from you. Will you just take it out and replace it with the truth? Will you just remove it and replace it with the, the love of God, the grace of God, the, the truth of God? Will you give us long suffering, Lord, where we were impatient? Will you give us joy when we were angry, Lord, and we were anxious? Will you give us peace instead? Thank you, Jesus. Oh, will you give us love instead of judgment and hatred? Will you give us righteousness, righteous thoughts instead of unrighteous thoughts, Lord? Will you give us your wisdom instead of our wisdom, Jesus? In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I'm just feeling that beautiful presence of the Holy Spirit. He's just so good, y'all. Oh, it's so good to be in his presence. <laughs> Again, I'm not streaming next week. As a reminder, I'm going to take the week off uh, and get some rest. I'm not taking the whole week off. I'm just taking the week off from, from streaming. Um, but I am going to rest and stuff. And uh, stop worrying. The audiobook is out. It's not on Audible yet because it hasn't posted, but technically it's, it's going to show up soon. It, it's already on uh, Nook, like Barnes & Noble, BooksAmillion.com, those kind of places. It's showing up on other places still. So if it's not where you like to listen to audiobooks, if that's something you like to do, just wait and hopefully it's going to be there. It will be on Audible soon. Um, 
I think that's it, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's it. I love y'all. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.